So this morning, um, one of the things I wanted to let you know is that in preparing for this message, I thought um, I would look through my library. Um, and if you've been in my office, you know, you go in there and there's a bunch of books in there. And somebody said to me not too long ago, wow, you have a lot of books. I said, you see my father-in-law's library. My father-in-law's library make this look like a dump. He had books, 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 and books. But I thought I would look through my library for the right tools to help me share this sermon with you today. And so I've got a confession to make about that library. I used to say that I had a problem. Well, the fact is I still do. I'm one of those people that will read multiple books, listen to audiobooks, and be looking for the next book to purchase, check out, or borrow all at the same time. It's just, it's a problem that I have. I need help, please. So just give me that 1-800 number and I'll call it. If anyway, if somebody could save me, I'd be grateful. But I looked through my library for the right tools, the, the right book that would help me express the truths of what it means to live as a citizen of the Upside Down Kingdom. And that, that's something we're going to continue to explore here as we, we look through the book of Matthew. And at some point, I was struck uh, as I was looking through the books on my shelf, and, and it may seem kind of uh, uh, that I'm playing some word games with you or uh, some simple semantics, but it hit me at a point. Um, and looking through my books, that I have books on how to think like Jesus. I have books on how to lead like Jesus. I have books on how to pray like Jesus. However, there's something I noticed. At one point, it leapt out to me is that I don't know that I have multiple books on how to be like Jesus. That realization kind of shocked me. It was a little embarrassing. The fact is, I wonder, I wonder if my own default is, well, of course, if you do these other things, you can't help but be like Jesus. To which my own life has answered numerous times, oh, yes, you can, Daniels. <laughs> yeah. You can do all that other stuff and not be. You can have all these techniques and tips at a level that does not transform you to your very core, core and you avoid ending up being like Jesus. But I believe that's what this portion in particular of the Sermon on the Mount is about. It is critical. So um, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to your Bible in Matthew chapter 5. Maybe you have an app on your phone. Go ahead and pull that up. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to begin in verse 13. But here's the thing I want us to come away with as we look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. Beginning in verse 13 today is this. In these seven verses that begin with verse 13, Jesus makes several things profoundly clear about his people and about himself. His people are to have deep inner lives that are outwardly focused. We're to have these deep inner lives that are outwardly focused, and he himself embodies the very things he has been calling all of us to live up to and to love out. So we're supposed to love and live up. That's what he's calling us to. So we read a bit earlier, if you were with us last week, we read a bit earlier in Matthew chapter 5, that all of a sudden... Uh, these crowds are now beginning to follow Jesus. The crowds are growing, and they're following Jesus. They're drawn to Jesus. And as is the custom of his time, those who are also religious leaders, they're also following after Jesus, listening to see what this young man has to say. And Jesus sat down to teach with specificity about his kingdom. He says this, kingdom people are different, first of all, because they live from the inside out. Kingdom people are different because they live from the inside out. Read with me from verse uh, 13, beginning in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. You know what's really fascinating here is that 
the language that Jesus uses in speaking to his followers, that they're being the salt, it focuses much less on what we do, and instead, he's talking about what we are, what we are. And this is what I'm getting at when I say that kingdom people, according to Jesus, are different because of the way they live from the inside out. A quick but important note also. I want to be clear on something that's early on in this study through the Sermon on the Mount. It would really be a mistake for us to think of these words in this section of Matthew, the Beatitudes, as they're often called, just to think of them as blessedness. Well, what do I mean? by that. Well, for many, many years, there existed uh, in Jesus' time this, this narrative for being one of the blessed who would inherit God's kingdom. There were certain stipulations, there were requirements for centuries that had been handed down, and it boiled down to these five things. You're going to love it. These are the five things that in Jesus' day, if you had these things, you were blessed. You were good to go, okay? So here's the first one. You're, uh, according to Jesus, according to God, according to the Jews, you were, the Jews were in. Everybody else, you're out. As simple as that. I'm Jew, I'm in. You're not, you're out. Pretty simple, right? That's how they live. The second thing is, the kingdom of God was essentially only for men. Yeah. That's it. Just, just dudes. No one else. Uh, and if, Maybe, but you'd have to go to the end of the line, okay? Another thing, here's a third thing, that for years, if you were blessed, admission to the kingdom was only possible if you faithfully, unswervingly followed all the rituals and rules as are related to Jewish law. That was it. If you didn't, you weren't going to make it, okay? Fourth, Kingdom admission, getting into the kingdom, meant that you were physically complete and whole. No physical limitations would ever be allowed. I'm colorblind. Guess what that means? I don't get to go into the kingdom. That was the rule. That was a, a common rule then. Here's the last one. If you were poor, it was unequivocal evidence that your entrance to God's kingdom would never, ever be permissible. Those are the five guidelines. Ancient times, that's what it meant to be blessed. That's what it meant to, to go into the kingdom. So now, do you begin to grasp how Jesus' words here might run contrary to these kind of exclusive, long-held, tradition-bound words and understandings of the kingdom of God? Do you see how now what Jesus is saying might be causing a problem for some folks? Jesus' language is very inclusive. Actually, um, there's a guy who wrote a book called The Good and Beautiful Life. Jesus is giving these invitations of inclusion. And in these verses in particular, Jesus is lifting up the intrinsic value of all lives, of those who are hearing his words when he compares us to salt. In, his, in another book called The Sermon on the Mount, Amy Jill Levine said this. She said that the word salt finds its origins in a Latin word, cell, S-E-L. And from that root is where we get the word salary. Salary is pretty important, isn't it? Salary makes all the difference. That's an interesting, that's an interesting note to kind of hold on to for a bit. In the journal of biblical counseling. Timothy Keller, um, pastor for many years, Redeemer Church in Manhattan, he made the following observation about salt. He said this, the job of salt, Pastor Laura kind of talked about this a little bit too, the job of salt is to make something taste good, right? And I don't know about you, Keller goes on, he says, but I can't stand, I just can't stand Corn on the cob without salt on it, right? He says this, when I have eaten a piece of corn on the cob that I really like, I put it down and what do I say? Oh man, that was great salt. No, no, I don't say that. He said, I say that was a great piece of corn on the cob. Why? Because the job of the salt is not to make you think, 
how great the salt is, but how great the thing is with which it's involved. What if you're the salt in your small group Bible study? If you're the salt, people won't go away saying, that person really knows the Bible and had all the answers and showed me up. No, what happens when you go away from a small group in which you've been the salt? People don't say how great you were. They say, what a great group. What incredible truth. This is pretty simple, Keller says. Salt makes you feel better about life. Christians make you feel better. But religious people, they make you feel condemned. They make you feel worse. So now, put that thought together with the teaching that Jesus is laying out before the crowd that's kind of gathered around him, they're listening. He is assigning those in that day and to us in our day and age that are part of the kingdom. He's assigning this value that's considered immeasurable. It's clear in the day that Jesus is, he's reinforcing the value of salt. And then Jesus makes a connection to, of that value to the necessity of light. And the question becomes this. So when people see our lives, when they see the way we live, when they experience you or I, are they in fact seeing the light that points out, that shines the example of God's light in the world? And just so we're clear on this, Jesus, with this teaching, he's breaking all the rules. He is personifying the upside-down kingdom thing by including the very people who, when you read through the, uh, the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry, the very people that have been clearly and repeatedly excluded. But he's not done. I love this. Jesus doubles down. Jesus raises the stakes for what it means to be part of this upside-down kingdom because not only are kingdom people different because they live from the inside out, but additionally, kingdom people are different because we recognize this. It's not about us. And that kind of, that's such a discombobulating thought, right? You're supposed to live this different way, but ultimately, it's not about you. It's not about us. This is what we read in the next verse. Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see who? You? No. Who are they seeing? Anyone? Anyone? They're seeing the good deeds, and then they're glorifying your Father in heaven. So they're not really seeing you. They're looking right past you, and they're seeing God in heaven. We're not only people who are salt, though. We're not only people who live as lives, but the key is that it's not about us, but rather we point people to the Father in heaven. You know, um, I came across the following. This is a Facebook post. For those of you who don't use the interwebs, yeah, Facebook, that's what this is. It's from Facebook, okay? And it seemed pretty straightforward to me, okay? When we as followers of Jesus forget, neglect, resist giving the honor, the appreciation, the glory to God because of the things we do well or the outcomes of our serving or helping others. And instead, we consume all the attention, all the accolades, all the glory ourselves. It will wreck us to our core. And I didn't think it was a big deal when I, when I reposted this little dealio. But someone I knew from many years ago decided to jump into my DMs. <laughs> Somebody decided to direct message me and tell me how offended he was with what I shared in this post. He asked me if I was intentionally trying to hurt people by insinuating that somehow it was wrong to allow yourself to be appreciated by others. He then went on to tell me how often he had allowed people to thank him for all the things he'd done for them and wondered if I was trying to invalidate him, what he'd done, or how people had responded to him. So now, I'm going to do a real-time poll, okay? You don't have to raise your hand. If you prefer to abstain from participating, that's fine too. 
But here's a question. When you read this post, is the first thing that comes to mind that I, or more particularly Pete Scazzaro, am shaming you for allowing others to appreciate you? Is that the first thing that pops in your mind? But I think what's shared here is precisely aligned with the spirit of what Jesus says in this particular portion of the Sermon on the Mount. We have no business making the good news of Jesus, the limitless good gifts of God, the impeccable timing of God's providence about us. Because it's not about us. Because it's about our Father in heaven. Period. Or, as I've seen other places, period. That's just it. When we live like Jesus calls us to in this verse, Craig Keener writes this, it allows us to guard the motives of our hearts, right? And that's a good word from, from Keener and great instruction from Jesus. Remember, as kingdom citizens, it's not about you. It's not about us. It's fascinating that this theme of reflecting God's light and the, the whole issue of light, it can be found throughout the, the New Testament, Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in, in, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Paul likens us to shining stars. And the word shine means to reflect, actually. It means to reflect. The scientific firm, the scientific word is albedo. A-L-B-E-D. It's a measurement of how much sunlight a celestial body reflects. The planet Venus, for example. How many of you have ever seen the planet Venus at night in a star? Have you ever seen that? It's pretty bright. It's pretty bright. It has the highest albino of 0.65. In other words, 65% of the light that hits Venus is reflected back out. Depending on where it's at in its, all, in its orbit, the almost a planet, Pluto. Pluto has an albedo ranging from 0.49 to 0.66. Our own nightlight, the moon. Do you know what its albino is? It's 0.07. Only 7% of sunlight is reflected, yet that light at night, it can, it, can be, it can guide our way. It can actually guide our way on cloudless nights. And in a similar sense, Everybody in here, we all have a spiritual albedo. We all have this spiritual sense in which we reflect light. We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. You cannot produce light. You hear me? You can't produce light. You can only reflect it. You can only reflect light. Kingdom people are different from the inside out. Kingdom people recognize it's not about us. And then Jesus makes this shift here in chapter 5 and explains that he is the one who now personifies kind of these deeper aspects of Jewish law. And he does this because he's the fulfillment of the law. Here's what we read as we continue on in Matthew chapter 5. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And this is kind of critical to grasp, okay? Jesus is not presenting some kind of rival system to the law of Moses and the words of the prophets. But he's actually talking about how he fulfills the law and the prophets. And that's in contrast with the traditions that the Pharisees or the religious teachers of the day are talking about. Jesus is telling his listeners, it's almost as if he's reading the minds of those that we find resisting him and his teachings. Jesus is saying this, don't be fooled. What the prophets and the teachers of the law in the Old Testament were all about, I am that promise fulfilled. If you were here a few weeks ago, 
We address this in terms of what Jesus answered when he was asked what was the greatest commandment. Uh, and he repeats it again. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, he teaches on this again. Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus is telling those who are listening to him, and he's telling us right now that all the ritual tithing of the law, all the ritual purity of the law, the Sabbath keeping of the law, it's going to remain in place. However, the most important thing over all of that, Jesus says, is love. Love exceeds. It doesn't nullify. It exceeds. It exceeds the law. Jesus is saying, you might think that living the law with all its rules and its ordinances and requirements was tough. Jesus is saying, wait till you get a load of what I'm asking you to do. What I'm demanding. You have to love each other. That's just astounding to me. That you could read through all the law and miss that part. But that's what Jesus is saying. You must love one another. And the evidence of that being the truth is coming up in the next few verses. So here's a final thing we see in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus himself personifies, or he embodies these deeper aspects of the law when he says this. Kingdom people have to live according to a higher law. And get me... I hope you understand how mind-boggling this is for a crowd that's listening to this word. They're thinking to themselves, what goes beyond the law? <laughs> what are you talking about, Jesus? Jesus says this, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The bottom line here, Jesus is taking on the legalism that the religious leaders of his day adhered to, although they probably didn't adhere to it all that well. And then, and then expected, those religious leaders expected everyone else to live their lives according to, and if you, or they, if you didn't, then you would be excoriated by them. Ah, they took great pride in that. But here's the truth. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, in somewhat similar to how we do right now, perhaps kept the laws from kind of this external point, eh, what you saw on the outside. But internally, that's a different story. And Jesus, later on in his ministry, uses incredibly strong language in the book of Matthew, particularly chapter 23, verse 27. This is what Jesus says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, again, stop and think about this for a moment. Jesus is publicly telling his listeners here in the Sermon on the Mount that the lives of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, that they're living, those lives, they're bogus. They're fake. It's a sham. Yeah, that's what he's telling his audience. You know who's standing in the crowd listening? Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. He's doing it in the open. Probably, like I said, with leaders of those groups in the crowd. And certainly, no doubt, certainly, there are folks who had probably been sent to at least maybe spy on Jesus, talk about what he's saying and doing. Can you imagine that report when they get back to where all the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes are hanging out? So, so what did Jesus have to say? Well, uh, he said, uh, 
Um, he said, well, come on, spit it out. What did he say? He basically said that you and all your religious buddies aren't really all that and that you're kind of fake. Let's, be, let's, let's just us be really real about this for a minute. You'd have to be intentionally, willfully, purposely blind to have missed the names, the stories, the scandals that have centered on the lives of some of the most well-known pastors, preachers, Bible-believing people in our cultural life and times who have demonstrated everything that Jesus is warning those who would be his followers about, right? Didn't just happen then, friends. It's heartbreakingly happening now, which is why the idea if we just all do the super-duper spiritual stuff, where people can see us doing it, talking about it, demanding that everybody else do it, insisting on it from a street corner or in a local school board meeting or at a library board meeting. That's a bad idea, especially if it's all human-powered piety and spirituality. Jesus is telling his listeners that what ultimately matters is the condition of our hearts, That is where true and authentic spirituality, that's where it's measured. In his book, The Jesus Jesus Alternative Plan, Richard Rohr writes this. He says, there's a telling phrase that's used in the Acts of the Apostles, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, to describe this new sect that's upsetting the old world order. The ancient city of Thessalonica is where we read this. And the Christians of that town, we read, were dragged before the city council and called this. I love this. The people who have been turning the world upside down. They have broken Caesar's edicts from Acts chapter 17, verses 6 through 7. Richard Rohr goes on and he shares in his book, one of the major weaknesses of the Christian understanding of Jesus is that we really do not understand what it was that made Jesus worth killing. It was not because he walked around saying, I am God. No, what got Jesus killed was he he came to tell the world that everything was changing, that what was would be no longer. Jesus as Rohr concludes, subverted or turned everything upside down when it came to things like family, possessions, status, the very nature of sacrificial religion. That's what got him killed. And in living out what it means to be a citizen of his upside-down kingdom, friends, we can be assured of difficulty, Uh, well, in the moment, but blessings that are undeniable as well. Would you pray with me? God, you have called us to be citizens in this upside-down reality. Lord, it's an upside-down reality that maybe the world doesn't see, but it exists. It's parallel to to our existence. God, you have told us, you have called us to this different life with its challenges and its difficulties. But God, you have also told us over and over again. You've not told us, but you've demonstrated in the lives of those who've gone before us demonstrate, Lord, the reality of blessings too immeasurable to count. Lord, um, we ask that you would give us the strength, you would give us the vision, you would give us, Lord, um, in those opportunities, maybe even the words, Lord, to live a life in a way that demonstrates the reality of this upside-down kingdom. We live in a time that looks for people. It, It is looking for a people who live a little bit differently, perhaps, than others in the world. 
not as a point of pride or, uh, Lord, how much greater we are, but rather, just like your word tells us, it points to you. Everything that we do points to you as a good, loving, heavenly Father. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus, and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.